Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Leandra Rosio from uh, University of Roma Tor Vergata. He's going to talk about orospheres in strongly pseudo convex domain. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Filippo. And I want to start by thanking uh, the organizers of this seminar because uh, I think it's, uh, it's great to keep us together in these uh, difficult times. And uh, so I will talk about um, a recent uh, uh, work, which is in collaboration with uh, Matteo Fiacchi, Sebastian Gontar, and Lorenzo Guerini. Uh, so let me start by uh, recalling some uh, uh, basic uh, facts uh, about uh, horse fears. Uh, in complex analysis. So, uh, of course, uh, um, the example most people has in mind is the, uh, the horror disks uh, and horror cir circles of uh, the unit disk, but uh, a very similar uh, concept uh, uh, exists in, uh, in higher dimension, so I will introduce directly uh, in higher dimension. So uh, let's consider the complex space of uh, dimension Q and uh, the unit ball in, uh, in the complex space. And then uh, uh, we can define a horosphere uh, with a center centered in a point uh, in uh, the boundary of the ball and uh, with a given radius, R, uh, with the formula uh, you, you can see here. It's a formula uh, which uh, uses, um, it, it's extrinsic, uh, of course. Uh, it, it uses the Hermitian uh, product of uh, uh, the complex uh, space and, uh, and the norm of uh, a, a vector. And uh, so it's uh, this, uh, the sublevel set of uh, this function. And uh, it turns out uh, with a simple uh, computation that uh, it's an ellipsoid, uh, which touches uh, the point uh, uh, zeta in the boundary, uh, um, uh, but uh, the, the remaining part, of course, is inside. Uh, so it's internally tangent to the unit ball. And, um, Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, why uh, why are these um, uh, this concept? Uh, why is this concept useful? Uh, one uh, uh, simple example, which is uh, which is a result, uh, a sort of a generalization of uh, the Schwarz lemma uh, to uh, to the boundary. Uh, you will see uh, is the Julia lemma. So uh, assume you have a holomorphic self map of uh, the ball from, from the ball to itself, and uh, you have a point in, in the boundary uh, where the dilation of uh, the map is finite. So what is the dilation? It, it, it's a sort uh, of uh, derivative uh, at, at the point, uh, but uh, of course uh, uh, the map is, uh, is not regular at the boundary of the ball. It can be very, very wild. But uh, so we, we can define this sort of derivative, which is uh, the limit as z goes to zeta uh, of uh, one minus uh, uh, modulus of fz over one minus modulus of z. So you assume that this is uh, um, finite. Then, uh, as a consequence, you obtain the existence of a unique point in, uh, in the boundary of the ball. Uh, such that uh, you have uh, that uh, every horosphere centered in zeta is mapped by f in a, a corresponding horosphere uh, centered in eta, in eta, where the uh, radius is simply multiplied by lambda, so which is uh, uh, the dilation. Uh, so it's a sort of uh, a Schwarz lemma at the boundary. Uh, so uh, Abate generalized uh, this, uh, uh, the concept of orosphere and the Julia lemma uh, to strongly convex domains. And um, uh, the, basic, uh, uh, the basic idea to do so is uh, to uh, leave the extrinsic uh, uh, definition. So we, uh, and uh, we search for an intrinsic definition in terms of uh, something intrinsic, uh, for example, the Kobayashi uh, distance of the ball. 
so uh, you 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 can see that the the previous uh, formula I give is I gave is actually uh, equivalent to uh, this um, uh, this intrinsic formula. So we take the limit as uh, w goes to zeta of the difference between the distance from z to w and the distance from w to uh, the origin. Okay, and then we take the sublevel set again of uh, of this function. Uh, so this, uh, of course, uh, one uh, th there is a limit here, and uh, the point is uh, why does this limit exist? So this uh, was proved by Abate in the 90s. So um, in the if the we have this strongly convex domain uh, which has a C3 smooth boundary, then this limit uh, exists. Um, for of course in. A, a slightly a slight difference in a, in a strongly uh, convex domain. There is no preferred uh, uh, origin. Okay, so let's take let's fix a base point. So a point P, which uh, uh, which is fixed and will will be a, a sort of a pole or base point for us. So uh, we fix this point and then this limit uh, actually exists. And then uh, uh, of course uh, he defined uh, the horosphere as the uh, sublevel set of uh, this limit function. And then uh, uh, with this new uh, concept, uh, he proved uh, uh, the Julia, uh, the Julia um, let me give uh, directly the Julia lemma. Uh, so uh, he proved uh, a generalization of the Julia lemma. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, dilation needs to be uh, generalized too. And, but this is also, uh, uh, you can see that uh, an, uh, an intrinsic definition can be given of the dilation uh, as the limb inf as z goes to uh, zeta of the uh, difference, the difference of the distance uh, between p and z and the distance between p and f of z. Of course, this now uh, will depend on the base point. So uh, Abate proved this uh, uh, using this intrinsic concept, a uh, generalization of uh, the Julia lemma. So the statement is uh, precisely uh, as it was uh, before. Uh, only, of course, uh, the meaning of uh, the objects uh, have changed. Um, so this is a generalization uh, to the ball. And uh, so, but the, uh, let's say one of the most important points here is uh, to prove the existence of this limit. Uh, and um, so the limit, let me go back. So uh, this limit here, this limit star. And how did he prove this? Uh, so the proof is based on Lamper theory. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, a rather uh, a deep uh, uh, theory of, of uh, complex geodesics in strongly convex domains. And uh, uh, so uh, from the results of uh, Lamp, actually Lampert proved that if you take a point and then uh, uh, you define a function uh, k z0 taking the hyperbolic tangent uh, of uh, the, the, dis the uh, Kobayashi distance from, uh, from a point to this uh, fixed point z z0, and then uh, you extend this function at the boundary, setting it, it equal to 1, uh, you will obtain uh, something uh, which is uh, uh, c r minus 2 in the closure minus uh, the uh, base point z z0. Uh, assuming that the boundary is uh, CR. Okay, so you lose uh, uh, two degrees uh, of uh, regularity. Uh, and then uh, using, uh, using this, one uh, about proved that uh, if you have a C3 regularity at the boundary, you can express this limit as uh, this uh, beautiful uh, um, uh, ratio here, log of the log of uh, two uh, normal derivatives of uh, these functions uh, here. So since the uh, boundary is C3, this function RC1, so this has a perfect sense. Um, okay, so now um, one, uh, one question that uh, is left open, of course, is uh, uh, okay, but what happens in uh, strongly pseudo-convex domains? Uh, one would like to imagine that uh, uh, this uh, uh, metric uh, concept uh, should uh, should make sense uh, there too. But uh, the problem is that in strongly pseudo-convex domains, of course, uh, uh, the, the theory of uh, Lampert is not available. So uh, it is uh, difficult to obtain 
uh, a proof along these uh, lines. So uh, what um, what uh, what we uh, try, we we did is uh, try to reformulate uh, this problem in terms of uh, uh, abstract uh, compactifications. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one thing uh, that is important to notice is that this uh, limit star in a general uh, uh, bounded domain uh, will not always uh, exist. Uh, it's simple uh, computation. You take a point in the by disk, uh, in, the, in the distinguished boundary of the by disk, and this limit uh, will, uh, will not exist. So uh, there is something, uh, uh, you need some assumption, of course, on the, on the structure of, this, uh, of these domains. But it's legitimate to assume that uh, it will work on bounded strongly pseudo-convex domains. Uh, so let me uh, now uh, give some uh, details about uh, uh, these uh, compactifications we considered. So this is a very, um, very elementary um, uh, uh, definition. So what is a compactification of a space? Uh, it's just a, a topological embedding of um, of our uh, of our topological space in a bigger space uh, Y, uh, which is compact and such that the closure of the image is the space. Uh, what is interesting uh, about compactification is that there is a sort of uh, uh, partial order uh, among uh, among them. Uh, so we, we can say that uh, uh, a compactification uh, Y1 is bigger than a compactification Y2 if there is a, a continuous map which makes uh, this diagram here uh, commute. So if uh, I2 is equal to uh, phi composed I1. Um, of course, uh, if uh, phi is an homeomorphism, then it makes perfect sense to consider these two compactification as the same thing. And we will say that they are topologically equivalent. Uh, so if now we uh, work, we restrict to Hausdorff uh, compactification, then we have this uh, nice elementary uh, uh, remark that uh, if y1 is bigger than y2 and y2 is bigger than y1, then they are actually uh, equal, meaning they are uh, topologically equivalent. OK, so uh, now uh, what we will do is uh, uh, try to compare two different uh, compactifications. Uh, actually, both are uh, introduced by Gromov uh, in, uh, in different uh, works. Uh, so this gives a, a bit of a problem for the name. So we will call one the Horo function compactification and the other one the Gromov compactification. So uh, let, let me start with the Horo function compactification. You, uh, this works uh, um, for a uh, any uh, proper metric space, uh, you consider C of X, uh, the space of all continuous uh, function on uh, uh, real valued uh, continuous function on, uh, on the space, and then you quotient uh, by the subspace of constant functions. And then uh, you embed your, uh, uh, your space X in this, uh, in this uh, resulting space C star of X, sending uh, the point in the class of uh, uh, the function given by the distance uh, uh, to this point. So the, the, the function g of x, distance to the point x. Uh, and then you take uh, the closure of, uh, of this uh, image in the space uh, c star of x. And this gives you a, uh, an interesting uh, and natural compactification of the space, which is called the Horo function compactification. Sorry, Leandro, what's the topology on C of X? Uh, you, you take uh, locally um, converge uniform convergence on compacta. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, let me. Uh, so, this is a an interesting uh, uh, description of this uh, compactification, uh, very abstract, but there is, uh, let's say, uh, a bit more uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, way of understanding uh, to the topology here. So uh, you fix a base point, P, and then uh, you will have that a sequence, Wn, in, in your topological space, uh, converges uh, in your uh, metric space, sorry, converges uh, uh, to a uh, point um, in, the, in the boundary. So when I say uh, uh, partial H, I didn't write it, but I mean uh, the boundary 
uh, with respect uh, uh, obtained by uh, using this compactification. OK, so the point we add to the space. So um, a point, uh, a sequence converges to a point uh, uh, C in, uh, in the horosphere, uh, horo function boundary, which is represented by a function uh, H vanishing at, P, uh, at the point P, if and only if uh, this uh, difference here, the difference between the distance from X to WN uh, and, the uh, and the distance from WN to P uh, converges to H uniformly on compact subset. And of course, uh, uh, you should see of this, uh, this uh, reminds you uh, of uh, what we used to define horosphere. Of course, this is not a, a coincidence. So, um, so this is a, a concrete way of understanding uh, the convergence here. And now we can re uh, reformulate the problem. So um, you take uh, a strongly pseudo-convex bounded domain in CQ with C2 boundary, and uh, you will have that uh, the limit that uh, we are interested in, this limit star, uh, exists if the Euclidean uh, compactification is bigger than the Horo function compactification. OK, this is just, uh, uh, it's actually, there is nothing here. It's just a rephrasing of uh, the, uh, the existence of the limit. Uh, and uh, well, we, we didn't, we didn't uh, gain much uh, with this reformulation for the moment, because this is, uh, I mean, the difficulty of proving this is exactly the same as proving the existence of the limit. But then uh, we can uh, do uh, something else uh, and recall the, the second compactification by uh, Gromov. So uh, Balok and Bonk proved in a beautiful paper that uh, um, a strongly pseudo-convex uh, uh, domain with, uh, with C2 boundary is actually Gromov hyperbolic uh, uh, as, as a metric space. And uh, it's, uh, uh, the Gromov compactification is equivalent, topologically equivalent to the Euclidean compactification. So let me uh, briefly uh, remind what, what these, uh, what these uh, terms mean. So uh, Gromov, uh, a metric space, uh, here we need uh, maybe some more, a bit uh, more structure. Let's assume that it's proper and geodesic. Uh, is a delta Gromov hyperbolic, where delta is a constant, positive constant, if uh, every geodesic triangle is delta slim. So this uh, simply means that if, uh, um, you take one, one side of the geodesic triangle, it will be contained in the delta neighborhood of the union of the two other sides. Okay, <laughs> this is um, uh, the concept of Gromov hyperbolicity, delta Gromov hyperbolicity, and we simply say that it's Gromov hyperbolic if it is delta Gromov hyperbolic for some uh, delta uh, bigger than zero. So uh, it's a very interesting metric concept. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one, one reason of uh, wh why it is interesting is that uh, it comes with uh, a uh, compactification. Uh, and the compactification is obtained in a very simple and elegant way. You uh, consider the set of all uh, geodesic rays in uh, in this in uh, in your metric space and you call it r of x and then uh, you uh, define an equivalence relation uh, among uh, um, all these uh, geodesic rays you say that uh, two rays gamma and sigma are asymptotic if uh, the distance from the point gamma t to the point sigma t is bounded okay um, so uh, it's not uh, i mean uh, it's not immediate why we would call that asymptotic, but uh, okay, that's the name. And then uh, um, the, um, you, you, you have this equivalence relation, and then you take uh, the quotient of uh, the space of all geodesic rays modulo this equivalence relation. Okay, and uh, so you have, uh, you obtain a set, and uh, uh, Actually, you, uh, you, you can uh, endow it of a topology, which makes it a compactification. 
And uh, let me describe uh, um, briefly the convergence here. So the convergence works, uh, works in this way. I, again, you need to fix a base point P. And then you will have uh, that a sequence Xn in the metric space will converge to a point uh, at, uh, uh, in the Gromov boundary. If and only if uh, the following happens. So you, you take a sequence gamma n of uh, geodesic segments, which connect uh, the base point that you have chosen to the point uh, xn of the sequence. OK, this exists, of course, because uh, your, your uh, uh, metric space is geodesic. OK, so then now you have a, a sequence of geodesics, and then you assume uh, that for any subsequence that converges uniformly on compact subset, the limit is an uh, um, array which belongs to the equivalence class uh, Xi. Xi, Xi. So uh, remember that the Xi is a, a point in the Gromov boundary, so it's an equivalence class of rays. OK, so you, you simply want that the, the limit uh, belongs to this equivalence class of rays. OK. Uh, now, so you have these two uh, concepts of uh, compactifying a metric space. Uh, of course, uh, when it is uh, Gromov hyperbolic, you have uh, the two. Uh, so it's very natural to ask whether there is a relation between the two compactification. And uh, uh, of course, it would be uh, very interesting. It, it, it would be very uh, interesting to us if they were the same, because then we would have solved our initial problem. Uh, unluckily, uh, there is only uh, one um, inequality, so to say. So a theorem by Webster and Winchester uh, says that the Horo function compactification is bigger than the Gromov compactification. And uh, this is not uh, what we wanted. Uh, okay, we, we need the other inequality to, to prove the existence of, uh, of the limit uh, uh, in, in the Abate definition. So uh, it is actually false. The, the other inequality is actually false in general. Okay, so um, if, you, if you take uh, in, in this paper by Webster and Winchester, you can uh, find a, a, actually a counterexample. You take this um, uh, subset of uh, R, R2. It's, it's, it's a graph, OK? And uh, you endow it with the um, uh, length metric, which is induced by R2. And then uh, you, you see uh, that um, any geodesic here, any geodesic ray, necessary, necessarily uh, is uh, eventually uh, equal to the uh, line y equal to 1 or to the line y equal to uh, minus 1. And uh, so um, you will have that uh, um, the, Gromov pound, the Gromov boundary is actually a unique point because any two, um, any two uh, geodesic rays are asymptotic. And if you do a little calculation, you find out that the uh, horror function uh, boundary is actually uh, the segment minus one one with the uh, Euclidean topology. OK, so uh, the very different, uh, uh, very different boundary in this case. OK, uh, so what uh, we did is uh, uh, try to uh, single out a metric property which is satisfied by uh, C2 strongly pseudo-convex uh, uh, domains uh -huh. as metric spaces, uh, and which uh, uh, gives you that the two compactifications are the same. Of course, uh, this example needs not to satisfy that property. And uh, so the property, uh, we uh, called it the approaching geodesic property, and it's uh, uh, pretty simple to state. So uh, you, you assume um, first we needed the definition of strongly asymptotic. So uh, we said that two geodesic rays are strongly asymptotic if uh, modulo a reparametrization of, uh, of the rays, their distance goes to zero. OK, so the distance of gamma t 
plus uh, uh, capital T, sigma T plus capital S is equal to zero. And uh, an equivalent way of stating this is that the distance between uh, gamma T and the geodesic sigma goes to zero as T goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, these, uh, these two geodesic rays are strongly asymptotic if they really come together. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, then we say uh, simply that uh, uh, a space has approaching geodesics if every asymptotic ray is actually strongly asymptotic. Okay, so if you have this, uh, uh, you gain from asymptotic, you immediately gain uh, strongly asymptotic. And this happens in uh, some uh, concrete interesting cases. Uh, for example, in, in the ball, uh, of course, in the disk, it's very simple to see that, uh, that this is the case in the disk, but also in the unit ball, in uh, cat minus one spaces, in zero hyperbolic metric spaces, and also in uh, convex domains uh, of uh, um, the um, uh, Euclidean uh, real uh, uh, space uh, endowed with the Hilbert metric. So when they are gram of hyperbolic, they are actually, um, they have approaching geodesics. Okay. And so uh, I, can, I can state our two results. Uh, the first, is that if, uh, as you imagine, if uh, a, a gram of hyperbolic metric space uh, has approaching geodesics, then the gram of uh, compactification is bigger than the horror function compactification. And, and uh, thus, as, as we uh, saw before, they are actually uh, topologically equivalent. And uh, so the, uh, the limit uh, we are interested in will exist. And the second theorem is that uh, a strongly pseudo-convex domain uh, has approaching geodesics. So uh, these are the two, two results I, I want to um, describe now. Uh, so how do you prove uh, the first one? So uh, we want to show that if we have approaching uh, geodesics, then we have uh, this, uh, uh, the Gromov compactification is bigger than the Hor function compactification. Uh, so the first thing to do is associate to every geodesic ray a horror function. And there is a, a very classical way of doing this uh, is uh, the Boosman function. So you take a, a geodesic ray gamma and uh, you define the uh, a function, the Boosman function associated to the gamma is uh, to the geodesic gamma is simply this, uh, this function here which uh, has uh, two entries. Uh, you can think as the uh, second uh, entry, the second variable as uh, the base point. And uh, you, you, you do the, the limit uh, that we are interested in, but now where uh, the, um, the point is only allowed to move along the geodesic. Okay, so it's the limit of the distance, uh, of the difference between the distance from X to gamma T minus the distance from gamma t to y. Okay, since this is a geodesic, actually this limit exists. Okay, so uh, we obtain, uh, of course, a horror function, uh, b, uh, b gamma, and uh, uh, its class uh, as a horror function, so in the horror function uh, um, compactification, does not depend on the base point. Okay, so uh, this actually defines uh, a map from uh, the space of all rays to the uh, horror function boundary. Okay, so and uh, and this is good because uh, we want to uh, we want to find a continuous uh, function from the Gromov uh, compactification to the horror function compactification. So we are in the right direction. Okay, so. Uh, the, the, the lemma that we now uh, need is uh, telling us that we can pass to the quotient. So this Boosman map, actually, uh, if uh, two rays are equivalent, then they are mapped in the same uh, horror function uh, boundary point. Okay, so this is what we need to, to define this map. And uh, okay, the, the proof is, uh, is quite simple. Actually, you just uh, uh, you just uh, have take two um, 
asymptotic geodesic rays. Since you have the approaching geodesic property, then uh, they are automatically strongly asymptotic, which is uh, what we need. And then uh, you take this uh, reparameterization so that uh, uh, they come together uh, at, uh, at infinity. So the distance goes to zero. And then uh, you, you simply write this, uh, this expression here under, uh, under this parenthesis. Uh, you see that the first term here converges to the Boosman uh, um, function of gamma. The second term converges to the Boosman function of sigma. And uh, using twice um, like a triangular inequality, you see that this is uh, uh, smaller than uh, uh, the distance between uh, uh, gamma and sigma, uh, which goes to zero. OK, so in the limit, uh, uh, these two, um, these two function, uh, so this converts to the same limit, so they are equal. So this is uh, uh, quite simple, uh, and we just need to uh, show continuity now. Uh, then here uh, it's a bit more of work. So you want uh, um, that for every sequence WN, which converges to a point in the gram of boundary, uh, you want that this, uh, uh, this quantity here uh, converges uniformly on compacta to uh, this uh, um, this function B gamma uh, with base point P, okay, where gamma is a geodesic ray which represents uh, zeta. And uh, okay, this uh, also, uh, there is some computation here, but uh, what, what, once, you, once you end uh, the computation, you find yourself uh, this inequality. Uh, here you pass to a subsequence uh, of uh, Wn. And you find uh, that uh, this, uh, the limit here is uh, encapsulated between B gamma ZP and B gamma ZP plus uh, uh, something which goes to zero be because we have uh, um, because the two rays are uh, strongly asymptotic. Okay, so uh, this is how we prove uh, uh, the first result is uh, computation in uh, metric uh, metric spaces. And uh, OK, the second result is uh, uh, more, um, uh, of course, it's more related to uh, several complex variables. Uh, and uh, the idea, so I recall the second result is uh, showing that a um, domain with uh, a strongly pseudo-convex domain has approaching geodesics, exactly as the ball, for example. And um, the idea is uh, to rescale uh, using the squeezing function. So uh, this is a classical uh, tool uh, uh, of uh, several complex variables, but let me just recall the definition. So you have a bounded domain, and then uh, you define uh, uh, the family of uh, all uh, holomorphic injective uh, functions with image contained in the unit ball which send a, a given point z to the origin. OK, and then the squeezing function will be uh, the radius uh, uh, evaluated at the point z will simply be the radius of the biggest uh, ball uh, that you can fit in the image of, uh, of these maps. OK, um, uh, in the common image, uh, in the image of this map, sorry. And um, so uh, a theorem uh, by Deng, Guan, and Zhang uh, tells you that if uh, the domain is strongly um, pseudo-convex and uh, with C2 boundary, then the squeezing function converges to one as you uh, approach the boundary of the domain. OK, so in some sense, you, 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 can, you can think that this is telling you that the geometry is somehow similar to the uh, the geometry at the boundary is somehow similar to the geometry of the ball. Okay, so uh, let me let me tell you how you prove uh, uh, that uh, that you have approaching geodesic. We argue by contradiction. So assume we assume that uh, the theorem is false, and so that there are actually two uh, geodesic rays which are asymptotic, but not strongly asymptotic. OK, uh, so what does this mean? It, it actually means that there exists a sequence of uh, times Tn going to plus infinity, such that 
the distance of uh, uh, gamma one evaluated in TN, the distance, uh, I'm sorry, between gamma one TN and the geodesic gamma two is bigger than the uh, constant uh, little c, which is independent of m. Okay, and then uh, also notice that um, this uh, distance here is actually uh, smaller than the distance between gamma one in Tn and uh, gamma two in Tn, which is uh, smaller than a constant c, because by definition these two rays are uh, asymptotic. So we are now in this uh, uh, situation here. And uh, as a notation, we call the points gamma one uh, evaluated in Tn Z Zn. Okay, so this is the setting of the proof. And uh, the second step is uh, uh, reparametrizing these uh, geodesics. Uh, you simply uh, translate, you, you, you perform a translation by Tn in both uh, geodesics, so you enlarge the domain of definition. They, they were geodesic rays defined from zero to plus infinity. Now they are defined uh, from minus Tn uh, to plus infinity. Okay, the idea here is that we, in the limit we want to obtain geodesic lines. So uh, this is uh, what is happening. And uh, when you reparameterize in, in this way, and you call the gamma N1 and the gamma N2, the two uh, ge uh, reparameterized geodesics, uh, it, it, it's simply a renaming of what is happening. So uh, gamma n one of zero will be the point z n, and uh, the distance between uh, gamma n two of zero and z n is smaller than c. Okay, we just uh, rephrased the, this uh, this inequality here. So now after reparameterization, the third step is uh, scaling. So we rescale using the squeezing function. So uh, for every a n, we choose an injective holomorphic uh, uh, map with the uh, image contained in the ball, which sends the point z n to the origin, and which contain uh, whose image contains a ball of radius uh, exactly uh, the value of the squeezing function in z n, which we know converges to one. Okay, so eventually these uh, these um, these images, they contain a bigger and bigger ball, uh, which are exhausting the, the ball. Uh, so uh, now uh, compose our two geodesics with this uh, um, uh, map given by uh, the squeezing function. So uh, you call, uh, we call gamma n1 hat and gamma n2 hat, the two uh, resulting sequence of, uh, of maps. And uh, you take a, a subsequence uh, and uh, you obtain in the limit that both converge to a geodesic line of the ball now, because these, uh, these images, they, they exhaust the ball, they contain bigger and bigger balls. So actually what you find in the, in the limit is a geodesic line of the ball. Uh, two, I'm sorry, two geodesic line of the ball. And now we can find the contradiction because uh, uh, the first uh, geodesic line, let's call it eta one, uh, will uh, fix the origin. Okay. And uh, if you, if you uh, calculate the distance between the origin and the second geodesic line, it will be uh, exactly the limit of the distance between gamma one of Tn and gamma two, which we know by assumption that is uh, bigger than a little c. So these two geodesic lines are actually distinct. But uh, again, similar uh, computation here uh, gives you that the, um, that the supremum of the distance between uh, gamma one of T and gamma two of T is actually bounded by two c. So uh, this means that uh, these two geodesic lines, they have the same endpoints at plus and minus infinity. But it's uh, easy to see that uh, this uh, uh, cannot be the case, because in the, in, uh, in the unit ball, there is only one geodesic line which connects two points, two different points in the boundary.
Okay, so this uh, gives you the contradiction. And uh, so this argument actually uh, can be generalized to um, a slightly more um, a, a different, I mean, slightly more general uh, case. Um, so it's not really more general because we now we have to assume convex. So it would be interesting to understand if uh, uh, this theorem holds also in uh, um, pseudo convex domain of finite type. Uh, um, of course, in um, at the moment we don't even know that uh, these are uh, Gromov hyperbolic, at least uh, uh, if the dimension is uh, uh, bigger or equal than three. But what we know is that convex domains of finite type are Gromov hyperbolic, and uh, uh, we can uh, uh, do a, uh, a similar proof in this case. Uh, except we don't use the squeezing function now, but we use uh, a, a proper uh, scaling by uh, Hervé Gossier uh, and a very similar, uh, uh, very similar way of reasoning uh, gives you uh, as a result that the horosphere exists also in, in, uh, in this case. So, but there is a, uh, a difficulty in this case. So, um, while in the case of the unit ball, uh, sorry, while in the case of strongly convex, uh, strongly pseudo convex domain, uh, you use the squeezing function. So the, the limit domain that you obtain after rescaling is the unit ball, which is uh, very well behaved and uh, we know everything about it. In the finite type case, the situation is uh, more convoluted. So when you, when you perform uh, um, Hervé Gossier scaling, you obtain a model domain in the limit, uh, which is uh, uh, not as well behaved as the ball. It's uh, uh, we, let's call it the infinity, and is uh, this uh, um, domain of uh, CQ given by real part of W uh, strictly bigger than H of Z, where H is a, a um, polynomial uh, from uh, CQ minus one to R which is uh, convex, uh, non-degenerate, non-negative, weighted homogeneous. And uh, so the problem here is uh, that uh, uh, we, if we try to do the same proof as before, uh, we, uh, we, we encounter uh, the problem that we don't know whether uh, the straight line from, uh, um, from zero to infinity given by z equals zero and imaginary part of W equals zero is the unique uh, geodesic line connecting uh, zero at the, at the point at infinity. So we argue in a slightly different way. Uh, and the, the idea is uh, that uh, we, we, don't, we, we don't really need uh, in theorem one uh, that all uh, asymptotic uh, uh, geodesic rays are um, strongly asymptotic. Uh, it, it, it's enough to prove it for a subfamily, a subfamily F which satisfies uh, certain properties. And uh, the point here is that uh, we can take as a subfamily the subfamily of geodesic rays which are contained in a complex geodesics. So we, this allows us to, uh, to use uh, some complex analysis, uh, some more complex analysis, and uh, so we, we argue in, the, in this way. So we, we take two uh, asymptotic rays, and now we can assume that they both are contained in a complex geodesic. Then, uh, we, by calculation, you see that uh, under uh, Gaussian scaling, this, these two complex geodesics, now we forget about the rays, uh, but the two complex geodesics, they actually converge both to the vertical slice z equals zero in the model. OK, and then you can show that this implies that gamma and sigma are strongly asymptotic. So this is a slightly different uh, philosophy, but uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is some simil similarity still. And so <coughs> as a result of these, uh, of these uh, two theorems, we obtain a corollary uh, that the Julia lemma uh, uh, holds uh, in uh, strongly pseudo-convex domains and in convex domains of finite type. 
Um, but actually, uh, you can state it actually uh, a, a bit more general. So you 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 find that uh, when, when whenever you have a proper uh, geodesic Roma hyperbolic metric space, and then you assume that the two compactifications, the Hora function one and the Gromov one, are the same. So this happens uh, as we have seen when uh, when you have uh, uh, approaching geodesics. Then you take uh, a, um, a self map from the space to itself, which is non expanding. So uh, it generalizes uh, holomorphic functions, of course. And then uh, you assume that uh, you have a point in the boundary where the dilation is uh, finite, and then you have exactly uh, your Julia lemma we, uh, relative to points in the Gromov boundary. OK, so this uh, uh, then this result can be applied to strongly pseudo convex domains and two convex domains of finite type. So yes, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Leandro, so are there questions? Comments? Uh, yes, there is one, Pavel. Yes, uh, maybe it's a naive question, Leandro, but you mentioned at the beginning that uh, uh, in general, uh, the horosphere would depend not only on the radius, but also on the base point. Yes. Are there any uh, sufficient conditions for which there is no such a dependence, like in the unidisc, for example? Uh, I think also in the unit disk, you, if you if you change the pole, you probably. I mean, in the unit disk, you you never you never change the pole. You you always consider the uh, the origin, so you don't notice this. But I guess if you change the pole, you will you will no, change the radius. Yeah, you renormalize the radius. You renormalize uh, so as a, basically up to the change of the radius, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always it's always the case. I mean, the, if you only change the radius, uh, it, it's a very simple formula. Yeah. It's it would be the same family of uh, exactly. sets. Exactly. If you, so the you, don't see that, you, you don't see this because you you don't need to change base points in in the disk. Uh -huh. I see. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, I think there are other. Uh, Sergio? Oh, I ask if, oh, if your yeah. Julia Lem holds for proper mappings. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so in, in which setting uh, are we? A proper map, holomorphic proper mapping between um, a pseudo-convex, strongly pseudo-convex domain? Uh, I mean, uh, we just... The image of compact set is compact set. Yeah, but... Um, so we proved that it holds for holomorphic maps. So, in, in particular, I mean... Uh, but, uh, can you elaborate? expanding, okay, see, see, see. Holomorphic, okay, thank you. Josias. OK, so um, you said that um, when we use the um, only the strongly asymptotic uh, geodesics, then um, uh, could we could we define another boundary by only identifying strongly asymptotic geodesics? And do you know if uh, that will lead to any I don't know, sensible object where we could uh, have a similar result. Leandro? Seems to be a problem with the connection. Yes. I think, okay. I think Leandro is frozen, yes. But it's still connected. Leandro, are you there? No. Okay. 